Welcome to the webinar and thank you all for attending. My name is Anil Patri. I serve as the director of the NanoCore National Center for Toxicological Research, Food and Drug Administration. It's my privilege to host today's webinar on behalf of the National Nanotechnology Initiative, NNI in short. NNI is a US government R&D initiative consisting of over 20 federal agencies and departments who work together to achieve the shared vision of a future in which the ability to understand and control matter at the nanoscale leads to ongoing revolutions in technology and industry that benefit society. This year, NNI is celebrating the 20th anniversary of the 21st Century Research and Development Act. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to celebrate this event, the NNI agencies and the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office, NNCO, are organizing a hybrid symposium, enabling the nanotechnology revolution scheduled this Tuesday, March 5th, at the National Academies, showcasing the research and innovations of some of the outstanding scientists and leaders in nanotechnology. We would like to invite you to participate in this meeting, either in person, or online. You can register at the link provided here at the bottom of, uh, of, of the title page. Today's symposium is part of a webinar series on metrology organized by the NNCO with the NNI agencies to showcase the cutting edge research tools, methods, and methodologies to characterize nanomaterials, complex systems, and formulations. Measurements at the nanoscale pose a unique set of challenges owing partly due to the small dimensions of the material requiring advanced tools to develop new products and application. Uh, next slide, please. This series began with an introduction to nanometrology on January 5th with my NIST colleagues, uh, followed by the nanometrology for food, agriculture, and the environment on February 2nd. Recordings of these webinars has been posted to the nano.gov website, just in case if you missed these webinars. Today's webinar is focused on metrology of nanoscale medical products and pharmaceutical products. And the final webinar in this series on metrology of nanoparticles in electronics is scheduled on April 5th. Hope you all attend these webinars uh, and in case you miss these webinars, just like others, we, we will have these recordings posted on the nano.gov site. Coming back to today's webinar, even though there have been many approved medical products containing nanomaterials, there are many measurement challenges, especially for complex multifunctional products that may have targeting uh, therapeutic and imaging applications uh, for medical products. We are excited to have uh, excellent speakers today who will address some of these challenges in advanced uh, manufacturing systems, such as continuous manufacturing, characterization, and uh, targeting of nano-enabled uh, medical products or drug products. With that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Billy Smith, to introduce today's speakers. Billy? Thanks, Anil. I, I'm Billy Smith. I'm a research scientist in the FDA's Division of Pharmaceutical Quality Research, and I am really pleased today to introduce our speakers. Uh, so first up, we have Antonio Costa. Um, he has extensive knowledge uh, working on particle nanoparticle processing and has spent the last seven years working uh, on the development of the University of Connecticut's continuous manufacturing system for this uh, type of product. Uh, after receiving his uh, master's in biomedical engineering and his PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from University of Connecticut, Dr. Costa has served uh, as an assistant research professor in the University of Connecticut School of Pharmacy uh, before founding Diant Pharma, which he will talk about today in 2019. Uh, our second speaker, is Luke Franken, uh, he is the chief executive officer and co-founder of Spectrodyne, which you might have heard of. 
Um, he obtained his PhD in physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he studied electrical sensing and fluidic systems and particle analysis. He also received postdoctoral training in biochemistry and cancer cell biology and developed microfluidics based diagnostics uh, in the industry before co founding Spectrodyne. And lastly, we have Roger Pack. He is a research fellow uh, in the Biotherapeutic Pharmaceutical R&D Department of Pfizer in Andover, uh, Massachusetts. He has more than 25 years of in, uh, industrial experience working with Bristol-Myers Squibb, Infinity Pharmaceutics, Wyeth, and Pfizer, of course. Um, prior to that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the NIH um, and, uh, and University of California, Davis. Uh, he received his PhD in chemistry from UCLA. Currently, Roger specializes in drug delivery technologies within Pfizer. He leads the efforts on the lipids, polymers, and conjugation technology uh, related to nanoparticles and biotherapeutic drug delivery systems. Roger has led the effort on the ionizable and cationic and polymer lipids that are used in the mRNA COVID-19 lipid nanoparticle vaccine. Uh, Comirnaty, that's how you say it, I think. Um, so yeah, uh, we're looking forward to some really nice talks today. Uh, just before we jump into it, we have a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use the QA chat uh, at the bottom. The questions will be answered at the end of the seminar. Uh, also, this meeting will be recorded and posted later online at nano.gov. Uh, and so with that, uh, Tony, if you want to uh, start sharing the screen and put up your presentation, let's welcome Antonio Costa. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Billy, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, for the NNI and, and, and the NNCO, um, you know, it's a Great privilege to be able to uh, discuss uh, uh, our nanoparticle uh, processing system, and um, I'm going to just jump into it at the stage. Uh, so, what we're going to discuss today is measuring nanoparticles with continuous manufacturing. Uh, as Billy mentioned, my backgrounds uh, in biomedical engineering and also pharmaceutical sciences. Uh, this here is our continuous manufacturing system that we developed. Uh, this was over multiple years. Uh, we had about uh, 5.5 million dollars uh, from uh, various awards uh, from from the the FDA that went into this technology um, while I was at the the University of Connecticut. And so on the left hand side, we actually have our our first uh, prototype system that we developed, and and it's being operated inside of a clean room, and we're doing a liposomal uh, doxorubicin run. On the right hand side, this is uh, what we have today, um, as uh, with uh, with the company that I, that I started, uh, Diant Pharma. And we have um, multiple systems, but this one here on the right is is, uh, um, is our full system that, that goes over uh, multiple stages. And, and I'll get into, go into the details of the different uh, stages that we offer uh, on the system and that as a, as a continuous uh, single pass operation. So a much, uh, say, simplified way to make nanoparticles. So how do we make nanoparticles? And, um, just over, uh, just as a, a general overview. So we have the upstream processing. Uh, this is where, uh, for especially for mRNA or other or other types of API, uh, we have the API synthesis. Um, and uh, for for uh, nucleic acid, there'd be uh, harvesting, chromatography, polishing, et cetera. Um, but then there's also all the excipients, lipid, um, lipid, and other types of excipients that would be added onto the system. So when we actually get down to the actual synthesis of the or, or generation of the nanoparticles, uh, this is what we're calling downstream. In this case here, we have our particle formation stage. Uh, this, what we can do is use different types of mixers. Uh, we're, we focused on a turbulent jet mixer, but you can also use an impinging jet mixer and, and microfluidics as well. Uh, downstream from here, we have a dial filtration buffer exchange. Uh, this can be done with uh, TFF cassettes, uh, more flat sheet style or, or hollow fiber. And, and then this is really for, for cleaning up the system with respect to solvents and, and changing buffer uh, pH conditions. Then there's a particle modification stage uh, that, that can be done for, uh, for adjusting uh, the surface uh, characteristics of the nanoparticle. 
and also the internal uh, internal characteristics of the nanoparticle as well. This then leads to a storage release testing, uh, which which includes analytics and CQAs, um, and then then off to a sterile finish. So just to take a look at the process flow for how we generate these nanoparticles, which will then lead into how we can measure the nanoparticles. Um, so just starting you know, briefly on the left-hand side, we have our ethanol phase, uh, which, which has our lipid uh, pre-dissolved aqueous phase, which could be a nucleic acid or, or it could be uh, just a buffer or, or other type of API. Then this goes into a turbulent jet mixer, um, goes to a downstream conditioning module, and, and then a, another dilution port. Uh, the purpose of the dilution port is really to um, adjust the buffer condition uh, or uh, adjust the buffer or, or also um, reduce the, the overall solvent where these nanoparticles uh, can be very sensitive to, uh, to different uh, solvents that are on the system. And we need to rapidly remove uh, the solvent in order to uh, help uh, stabilize the intermediate uh, nanoparticles. And then that gets into our first level of PAT where we have our, our particle size analyzer and we'll, we'll get into uh, much more detail on, on this one here um, and, and, the, and the purpose of it, uh, but for the inline analysis of the, of the particle size. Downstream, we have our, our TFF stages, which can be used for concentrating the particles and also for buffer um, exchange and, and dilution and to further remove solvent. Uh, so in this case, typically we're, we're trying to target around 0.5% uh, volume to volume of the solvent or less. And, and then this, this would be suitable uh, for uh, injectable materials. PAT2, uh, we, we bring in here, which is uh, an NIR probe uh, and, and slash turbidity probe, which allows us to, uh, to analyze the, the particle concentration. Uh, so it's, it's more of a soft sensor approach that we take uh, for many of sure. these uh, to understand uh, what's happening with the, with, uh, sorry, uh, for, what's, uh, uh, for what's coming off the TFF stage. Active loading, this is another stage that we have uh, for, especially for liposomal doxorubicin. It's useful and uh, to, uh, to load uh, the, the, the doxorubicin into the nanoparticle, and we, we form uh, very nice crystals on the inside of the nanoparticle. And, and then we have a, uh, another PAT UV vis uh, spectrometer built in that can provide us with the total amount of API and also the percent encapsulation. So all of that can take place in in one second or, or so for each measurement versus offline approaches that can take multiple hours. And then lastly, a purification stage uh, with, with additional uh, PAT uh, to confirm uh, what was uh, you know, the, the level of loading percent encapsulation uh, that, that we observed uh, during the active loading process. So taking just a, a step back on the overall approach as and, and what, what are we trying to even target here and measure? Uh, so looking at a quality by design approach um, and, and understanding, you know, what are all the material attributes? What are all the process parameters that can actually impact uh, the quality attributes? And in this case, some of the quality attributes that we're looking at would be the particle size uh, with that, the polydispersity index, uh, and then also, uh, for example, the percent encapsulation, uh, total API, and then morphology is really important. Uh, different morphologies are present in these nanoparticles. And, and is there a way to measure those in line? Uh, residual solvent, which would lead to you know, instability. If, if, uh, if the residual solvent is too high, then, then uh, especially for the intermediates, we, we've seen uh, changes in the particle characteristics and particle size, uh, which could then ultimately impact loading and, and, then, and then the stability of the particle. So all of these are really important to understand, uh, work through, and then, and, and, uh, and then pin, uh, or determine uh, which ones we want to target on our system and which ones we actually want to measure. So different nanoparticles that we can generate on the system are, are shown here. So top left are liposomes or traditional liposome, which has a, a bilayer and then an aqueous uh, internal compartment. Um, this is the this is where the internal compartment is where uh, certain you know, water soluble API uh, can be loaded. And then the external bilayer is where um, is, is where the uh, uh, other other um, lipophilic molecules uh, can be loaded. LNPs, polymeric micelles, uh, different types of um, of liposomes are, are shown here as well, and 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 uh, and also mixtures of of, of uh, docetaxel, for example, and doxorubicin liposomes. Uh, when when looking at a, a nanoparticle, uh, the properties and the structure, 
Uh, so we have our, a, a bilayer and, and typical thickness we can we can say is, is roughly four to 10 nanometers, depending on the type of lipid. Uh, there may be a peg uh, thickness as well, zero to three nanometers in, di in, uh, in, in length uh, that, that can extend uh, beyond the, the, the bilayer itself. Um, so there, there's different measurements that we would need to take and understand you know, to really um, satisfy the certain specifications. Um, and the particle size range typically for these nanoparticles is around the 40 nanometers up to 500. Uh, we can go beyond as well uh, in diameter of these particles, but that's a typical range that we that we that we uh, and really around the five or the, the 100 nanometer mark for for pharmaceutical. So some of the PAT that we have on the system, um, and and how do we define it? Uh, so we have online, inline, and also at line slash offline measurement techniques. Um, so we look at different tools that we can use as, as uh, soft sensors, and then we generate predictive algorithms uh, that enable us to then uh, uh, to uh, relate that to certain critical uh, attributes or critical quality attributes, uh, such as the particle size or percent encapsulation. So we have dynamic light scattering on the top here, which we, we show for the, uh, for example, Z average and PDI, that we can get these in real time and measure every, every six seconds. Um, turbidity, we, we, we use this approach to understand um, total, uh, say, lipid uh, or lipid or, or nanoparticle concentration. And, and then we, we match this with an offline UPLC CAD method. And UV Viz, uh, which is very useful for uh, a lot of the small molecules, uh, certain API that we can uh, look at the total, total amount of API and also the percent encapsulation. Uh, this here is just showing how we can integrate the particle size analyzer into the system as a flow cell. Uh, this is a, a nano flow sizer by Inprost LSP and, and has a very nice uh, uh, system that we can, we can run at high flow rates through uh, the unit here and, and accurately determine particle size. And then we can also use this as a feedback mechanism uh, to then adjust the, the certain parameters, for example, flow rate on the system to then adjust the particle size in, in real time. And that's what's shown here. We start at 105 nanometers, and then we drop to about the 90 nanometer mark, uh, and and then maintains for the duration of the run. Uh, so for the integration for the PAT, uh, we we have, uh, and especially for the particle size, which shown here, um, that we need to have software that can communicate um, uh, with uh, various levels of software. Uh, so then all the data is, is stored in one location. Uh, that's critical. Um, for the particle size itself, uh, understanding uh, general you know, dynamic light scattering theory and, and, and what's important. Um, so, for example, solvent, viscosity, refractive index, uh, the wavelength that you're, uh, that you're working with uh, for the light source for the, for the measurement. Um, these, are all, these are all critical in, in, in actually determining and, and getting uh, um, accurate results. Um, for the nanoflow sizer itself, we want to look at certain aspects, focusing, edge, path length, intensity. Uh, when you're flowing through a flow cell, we need to understand the shear rate. That's critical. Otherwise, there may be too much noise or, or too much variability. So honing in and focusing on all of these is, is critical, uh, especially for the engineers when they're, when they're first uh, uh, determining a, a method and, and putting together an SOP. When, it, when we look at uh, the different measurement techniques, we have to keep in mind that there's different light sources, different uh, different tools that you can purchase out there may provide uh, different results, even though that they're the same uh, theory. So dynamic light scattering, there's different systems that are out there, uh, different different light sources, different wavelengths, um, and, and all of these will, pr will uh, produce uh, slight differences, say, in, in the particle size itself and, and the polydispersity index. Uh, so it has to. We have to keep in mind um, that that there are differences, and and that you know even from uh, uh, vendor to vendor. So um, you know understanding the internal workings of the system is important. And we took a look at here uh, different uh, different liposome uh, liposomal doxorubicin uh, that we processed on the system, and then and then uh, that the the RLD and the generic uh, versions that are out there. Um, and we can see uh, what we were, we were able to process nice spherical particles, uh, very low polydispersity index uh, using both a, a Malvern DLS and also a nano flow sizer. Um, and then we can see actually some some differences in in the polydispersity index when it comes to um, 
the nano flow sizer. And that's most likely due to a 1300 nanometer light source versus a, a 633 uh, laser source. Uh, so we can pull these differences out um, by, and, and once we understand uh, the actual mechanism of, uh, of the measurement. And uh, briefly, I'll just run through this a bit, uh, just for sake of time. Uh, but the, uh, we, did a, we did some work, liposomal doxorubicin, um, a more detailed analysis. And this was in collaboration with the Nanotechnology Characteriz Characterization Laboratory. Um, so a lot of great work uh, uh, was done here. And, and uh, you know, we definitely thank them for their support um, and, and uh, for, for some of the animal studies that were done. Uh, for the cryo TM, uh, we just a uh, similar slide to what I showed before, but we were able to generate nice spherical particles using a um, using a continuous process. And then when we look at the batch processes, there are differences. We can get more elongated particles, uh, and then also uh, smaller and and uh, smaller particles, and even empty particles. Uh, so this is it's really critical uh, to understand the process uh, parameters and their impacts on the CQAs. Another aspect is the, uh, the morphology of the actual crystal itself. Uh, liposomal doxorubicin has a, has a linear crystal, whereas uh, uh, we, we've, we've also been able to generate other types of nanoparticles that have circular doxorubicin crystals in, in them. And this is just based on different process changes on the system. Uh, so then being able to measure and understand uh, the impact of, of this type of crystal formation versus a linear uh, would be critical and, 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 you know, what percentage, for example, have, are, are at a circular versus linear and does that have any, uh, you know, clinical, uh, clinical outcomes? Is there, is there, is, is it actually doing something to the release profile, uh, of the particle or, or uptake? Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of, uh, questions that, that we do need answers, uh, to, uh, for this, you know, for different morphology changes. This here, we're just showing the different structures that we've seen so far: elongated uh, uh, particles, and elongated crystal, and then and then also um, uh, spherical crystals. And and, uh, and and this here shows a spherical circular crystal, and then also a, in between, almost a U-shaped, uh, which was possibly going from a linear to a circular configuration. Yeah, you know, aspect ratio is is important. There, there's been some reports. Uh, that, that elongated nanoparticles uh, uh, can uh, find their way and, and essentially uh, get stuck in extremities in the body. So there could be potential uh, clinical ad adverse events that, that take place. Um, so having a full understanding of the, of the morphology aspect ratio of these nanoparticles uh, is, is critical as well. And looking at also the dock structure itself, um, the, there's a twisting configuration that takes place with the crystal. There's a number of fibers uh, in, in each nanoparticle. Um, so having a, a just a proper measurement techniques that we can also do inline or online uh, would be uh, would be needed in the future for for a true uh, continuous operation. And then orthogonal testing techniques. Um, you know, looking at cryo TEM, how cryo TEM, which is more of a number distribution. Uh, we also looked at the using a spectrodyne and NCS1 for more of a volume distribution. And then matching that with the DLS or, or, or understanding DLS cumulant intensity based averages and, and trying to understand you know, where, uh, how all these come together. You know, they're, they're different techniques, so they're not a one to one comparison, but it is important um, you know, to have uh, the different testing performed to, to fully understand, uh, say, for example, subpopulations that may be present uh, that one technique uh, may not see. For example, intensity based uh, may may overshadow multiple uh, subpopulations versus uh, a volume or, or number distribution. Uh, you know, reproducibility and also how we measure. So, looking at when we're when measuring the particles uh, in in sodium chloride or PBS, um, and and uh, doing different levels of dilution, do we get the same results? Um, and and is it consistent? Uh, is dilution an impact uh, or not? So this is uh, this was nicely done here, um, and and we can see very you know, very tight distribution um, on the on these particles and, and very consistent particle size. Um, skip ahead here, and last uh, for another aspect, AF4 separation with inline malls and DLS. 
Uh, so this gives us a, a additional data on on the particles themselves. Uh, what we look at here is more of what's called shape factor. Um, this is this is when uh, adding uh, in, in plasma for understanding protein binding and if there's any impact uh, that that could re, that that you know may may lead to differences from the processing from how these or how these nanoparticles are processed. Uh, so looking at uh, for for this case when we looked at these nanoparticles, uh, the shape factor was. Uh, was was quite similar um, and and didn't impact the the binding or minimal protein binding. Uh, so with that I'd like to uh, thank you for your time and uh, just have some acknowledgments here um, and and uh, um, um, yeah, looking forward to the the uh, the other two talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, let's get John Luke up uh, in the interest of time. Remember to put your questions in the Q and A panel below. John Luke. Thank you. Um, that's a cool presentation, Tony. Makes me want to do uh, inline measurements on our system too. Now <laughs> we should talk about that. So uh, thanks very much for your attention today. And um, today I, I'm going to talk about just a little more generally physical characterization in nanomedicines, uh, describing some of the challenges, and then spectrodyne solution for uh, for how to do this better. Um, spectrodyne, if you're not familiar with us makes analytical instrumentation for uh, nanoparticle analysis generally. And our goal is really to reshape the discovery, development, and production of modern therapeutics through this more accurate uh, uh, quantification technology. You're all here, we're all here because nanoparticle applications are exciting and growing rapidly, right? Uh, for therapeutics, uh, also uh, for their potential as biomarkers and for their roles in fundamental biology. And these nanomedicines, nanoparticles, take a huge variety of forms. We saw a number of varieties from Tony of just the, of the liposome shapes, right? Um, but many common technology, or, you know, nano-based, uh, nanoparticle-based therapeutics exist, LMPs, viruses, and uh, extracellular vesicles, which are these biological nanoparticles, if you haven't heard about them yet. Um, at this size scale, it's really important uh, to measure the size and concentration accurately because those basic physical parameters control very strongly the performance of the overall material. So size and concentration and payload are the three um, quality attributes that Specialdyne focuses on because they so directly impact the dose of the therapeutics, the therapeutics potency, in their biodistribution, ultimately the safety and efficacy of these formulations uh, are dependent extremely strongly on the basic, basic physical properties. And so that, that is where Spectrodyne's focus is. And I like to highlight the importance of these uh, metrics with sort of a canonical science experiment. So um, we're trying to compare, many people out there are often, many times a day, trying to compare two different formulations, right? Uh, and typically the way this is done is by applying them to a test system, maybe it's tissue culture media like shown here, and then measuring the outcome. So in this case, you know, formulation B produced more fluorescent cells than formulation A, and we detect that maybe with flow cytometry. Um, there's not one scientist on the call that would do this experiment without first controlling for the amount of starting material that got put into the test system, right? You have to control for the dose of the material in order to do a well-defined experiment. So size, concentration, and payload really are critical parameters for just doing good science. Um, now, there are a lot of uh, technologies out there for measuring the output of this experiment, um, but there are not a lot of suitable, accurate technologies for measuring the input, so the concentration of these nanomaterials. Um, there are, of course, many available. Uh, these are some of them. We heard about dynamic light scattering already. It's a very useful workhorse for nanomedicine applications. There's nanoparticle tracking analysis. There's increasingly more and more flow cytometry applications in nanomedicines. Um, and then for measuring payloads, really, they're only bulk assays. So they're like a ribogreen assay where you measure the total encapsulated payload uh, in your entire formulation. <clears throat> these are uh, averaging. So there are a couple of... Uh, key, you know, a couple of general observations about these technologies that are available. First of all, they're 100% optical techniques, right? They're all looking with effectively the same lens at the particles in the sample, and that's by looking at light scattering or, you know, uh, Brownian motion using light as a primary detection. 
as a result, they're fundamentally limited at the nanoscale, right? As the particles get smaller than the wavelength of light, there's a limit to how much you can learn about the particles using that light and the scattered light from it. And uh, so a bunch, the, you know, these technologies are still used for that, um, but they become less and less accurate for complex heterogeneous samples. So you have to make assumptions about the particles physical properties in order to infer conclusions from light scattering measurements. Um, and so these techniques generally, so we talked about this already in DLS and ensemble me method, it's averaging over all the particles in the, in the light beam. Uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis has its own limits, limitations as being a really useful QC tool because its limits of detection are, are variable depending on the sample. Um, and these ensemble methods are, are just tell you average information. Um, I would say flow cytometry is kind of the most promising here because it's a single particle method and it's a way of getting um, towards size and concentration uh, as well as fluorescence phenotype information. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, in a little more detail because we're talking about, we're, we're geeking out on nanometrology today. So flow cytometry, if you're not familiar with it, looks like works like this. You flow the particles through a laser uh, one by one. Okay, so it's a single particle method. And then you collect a variety of light that comes off the particles. There's a forward scatter light intensity, side scatter light intensity. And then you can measure fluorescence in any number of channels these days. Flow cytometry is very sophisticated. Um, and uh, so that's basically how it works. The detection event, so like how to count a particle, uh, you have two choices. Essentially, you can use scattered light signal to do that or you can maybe look at the fluorescence pulse uh, to detect the event of a particle being there so you know that you're analyzing a particle. Now, at the nanoscale, uh, this becomes a challenge for a few reasons. So if we're gonna count particles with the scattered light, um, we're limited because nanoparticles, especially biological ones, they scatter very weakly and they're very small. So they also scatter weakly. <clears throat> In practice, conventional flow cytometry is limited to one or 200 nanometers and up. Uh, for this reason, uh, just because the detectors are not good enough, but it's also sample dependent and very hardware dependent. Uh, if we look at, you know, another option would be to count particles with fluorescence, uh, but then you're only counting the fluorescent particles, right? Uh, so only those particles in your sample uh, can be detected. <clears throat> and what about measuring size? So from fluorescence, there are ways, there are um, ways that you can use a reference particle and stain, maybe a lipid membrane in a controlled way to infer size that way, but these are also material dependent methods. And if we look at scatter, <clears throat> this is a really key point because a lot of technologies use light scatter generally to infer the size of the particles. You really have to know the refractive index of every particle you're looking at in order to measure its size. And this causes a major problem for heterogeneous samples. And I'd like to highlight that with, um, uh, discussion of this paper briefly. This, this paper is uh, published in scientific reports about a new flow cytometry. A bunch of these authors are from Beckman Coulter. And they show this plot here, which is they're, they're talking about how the scatter intensity depends on the refractive indices of the particles. So this plot shows streamlines, uh, so light scatter intensity on the y-axis, and then particle size uh, as measured by other methods in, on the x-axis. And so on a flow cytometer, if you're going to detect individual particles with light scatter and you want to infer the size, say we detect a particle that has 1 times 10 to the 5 arbitrary units of light scatter. Okay, so we won't know without prior knowledge about the material whether this is caused by a 100 nanometer polystyrene particle or a 150 nanometer virus particle or even a 200 nanometer silica particle, right? All these particles have different refractive indices and it makes it impossible to measure their size by light scattering alone, okay? So that's why we need orthogonal methods. And even if you know <laughs> that you have a homogeneous sample, uh, this is still a complex question. So I'm, I'm gonna throw out a couple of uh, other papers that came out in response to this paper just to show how complex the problem of determining the refractive index of nanoparticles is. You know, I could bet that the, the particles that Tony showed with different crystal structures 
all have different refractive indices, even for the same size particle, just for that reason, it's, it's a complex problem. Okay, so there's still a critical need for direct and accurate measurements of size, concentration, and payload. And that's where Spectrodyne comes in. So this is our ARC particle analyzer. It makes direct and accurate measurements of those parameters down to about 50 nanometers currently. Importantly, it does not make, doesn't require any assumptions about the particle's properties. So uh, its accuracy is independent of the refractive index of the particles, the polydispersity of the sample, or the heterogeneity of the sample. It's very fast and easy to use. It's similar to flow cytometry, but um, much faster. There's no alignment or cleaning required for the technology. So let me, let me explain how it works because that'll inform the data examples that I get to next. Um, we use microfluidics. Uh, we leverage that technology very strongly. And what we do inside this microfluidic cartridge is flow the sample through an aperture in the fluid flow. And every time a particle goes through there, we measure an electrical signal not a light scattering signal, it's an electrical measurement that tells us how big the particle is and how fast it went through the constriction. So that tells us the flow rate and ultimately the concentration of particles. So this is a very direct method of sizing and measuring the concentration of particles. This has been on the market from us, Tony mentioned using this um, to look at his LMPs uh, in, for about 10 years now in the form of our NCS1 instrument. Um, before that, actually, it's been, uh, this is called the Coulter principle because Wallace Coulter invented it decades ago. It's been the gold standard for large particles and cells for a long time. Now, in the arc particle analyzer, what we've done is integrated the resistive pulse sensing method with fluorescence, single particle fluorescence. So now we excite particles one by one as they go through this channel, and we measure the fluorescence that's emitted from each particle individual individually simultaneously with the electrical signal. So we measure size and concentration electrically, and we measure the fluorescence, the intensity of the fluorescence emitted by each particle in up to three detection channels at the same time. Part of the reason this works so well is because of the microfluidics, um, and I won't spend too much time on this, but we've engineered a bunch of features inside these microfluidic cartridges that make it practical to use at the nanoscale. Uh, ultimately, these deliver ease of use to the end users, and we have customers that measure particles in plasma directly, other biofluids, tissue culture media, very complex samples that you could never measure, you know, they're too polydispersed and heterogeneous to measure with other techniques, and you can run them with very little sample prep uh, on our system. I wanted to show uh, one example that highlights uh, the power of this technology to resolve just a synthetic mixture of beads. Uh, to give you a flavor for how it works, and then I'll show you an example of LMP analysis. So uh, this, we call it a, our super mix. It's a mixture of six different polystyrene beads. They have overlapping sizes, different fluorochromes on them, some of the non-fluorescent, and they're all mixed together in a single sample. Um, this is what the raw data looks like, just so you have a sense for how the measurement works. Uh, the blue line is showing the electrical measurement. So this is detection of two different particles in real time by MRPS. And you can see this first one generates fluorescent signals in all three of our color channels uh, simultaneously, whereas this other one is a non-fluorescent particle in the sample, doesn't generate any fluorescent signal. When we use this system now to look at the supermix, this is what we get. So first of all, we can resolve all the different sizes of the sample, of the particles in the sample. So here are the 100 nanometer particles, 200 nanometers, and the different sizes. And we can do particle size distribution for all the different fluorescent channels. So the red fluorescent particle to size distribution is shown in red, yellow and yellow, et cetera. Um, and uh, we still, in this distribution, so this is showing concentration versus particle diameter. Uh, we cannot resolve these overlapping sizes, right? But they have different fluorochromes. So when we look at the fluorescence intensity in our three different detection channels, now we can use that to resolve all of the six components of the sample very clearly. They cluster very nicely and we can measure their, their fluorescence intensity and size and concentration that way. So this is a manufactured example, but we work in nanomedicines. And so let me show you an example of uh, LNP application. Here we measured uh, three different uh, RNA loaded LNP formulations. Um, they were formulated non-fluorescently, so these are just natural formulations. We stain them with a membrane permeable intercalating dye 
that lights up fluorescent when it intercalates with the RNA payload inside the particles. It's very easy sample prep. There's no washing, and we just measure the sample uh, on the arc. When we look at just the concentration versus size distributions for these samples, this is what we get. So the fairly broad dispersion of particle sizes, and there are subtle differences between the size distributions. We can be quantitative over any subrange uh, that you want over this size range that's being measured. But let's look at the fluorescence because it's uh, much more significant differences here. So again, we're looking at the three different formulations. And this plot is now showing a dot for every particle. Every single particle has been detected with the brightness along the y-axis and the particle diameter along the x-axis. So the brighter the particle means the more encapsulated payload is in each particle. Uh, and so the higher up they are along the y-axis. We have a detection limit that's well-defined uh, uh, for the brightness intensity that we can detect. And so we can do a kind of an over-under analysis of this sample where uh, it's very clear in the blue formulation, about half the particles are carrying payload and are fluorescent. Whereas in the formulation C, a much smaller fraction of the particles carry the payload. Uh, and we can be quantitative over the absolute concentration of all these particles. Our measurements of brightness are quantitative also. So we can compare the distribution of loading between these different formulations. So you can see formulation C is very few. Formulation A contains much more, a higher concentration of highly loaded particles than formulation B in green. But the inverse is true for lower uh, brightness, lower loaded. And then the ultimate goal here is what's the size and concentration of the loaded particles in this sample? So we can put a gate right around the fluorescent particles and be quantitative of the concentration versus size of just the loaded particles in the sample over any size range that uh, we can measure. So this is showing the concentration versus size of just the payload carrying particles uh, in these three different formulations. So the ARC has allowed us to directly measure the RNA payload on a single particle basis, uh, quantify the particle loading, so full versus empty as a function of true, true particle size, measure the concentration of size of the active, the loaded particles, um, and the empty ones, and ultimately allow the faster and more effective evaluation of these different formulations uh, in, a, in a pharmaceutical environment. Uh, we're short on time, so I'm not going to show this next example, uh, except to say that we can also quantify surface markers uh, on these samples, on, on nanoparticle samples. I think this will feed into Roger, uh, Dr. Pak's presentation next. Uh, and we can be quantitative over the number of epitopes that are expressed on the surface of some of these particles, um, and I'll leave it at that. So. Uh, I hope I've shown you, introduced you to the ARC, lots of information about this on our website uh, to learn more. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Look forward to the question period. Thank you so much, John Luke. Remember, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. Uh, up next, we have Roger. Um, go ahead and share your screen and we'll get moving. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, good day, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, thanks, um, Billy, for the uh, introduction. Today, I'll be talking about analytical characterization of targeting ligands on polymeric nanoparticles. Um, while um, my talk will be focused on polymeric nanoparticles, the strategies here for analyzing could be applied to other particles such as uh, lipid nanoparticles and liposomes. Okay, so I'll uh, talk about polymeric nanoparticles, get into targeting ligands, and then talk about the analytical methods, especially focusing on the functionalized polymers and uh, target ligand density on the nanoparticles. Then I'll go into a case study with uh, target ligand conjugated nanoparticles for delivery to dendritic cells. So everyone on this call probably is well aware of uh, the, the width and breadth of um, the different types of nanoparticles and the sizes. Uh, I'll be focused on the polymeric nanoparticles with a PEG corona. 
So that's depicted here where the uh, hydrophobic interior is a polylactic acid polymer, a uh, block copolymer with uh, polyethylene glycol with a terminus that has some functional group. In this case, it's a malamid linker with a uh, conjugated to a thiol on the target ligand, which in this case is a fab. There are two payloads that we want to encapsulate. One is a hydrophilic payload, one is a hydrophobic payload. In order to do that, we, uh, there are a number of ways to engineer a nanoparticle, but we chose, we chose a double emulsion process uh, where uh, you take the aqueous phase, which is a hydrophilic payload containing aqueous, uh, mix it with your organic phase, which is the hydrophobic payload and the polymer, uh, homogenize this with a microfluidizer, and take that first emulsion, which is a water and oil format, and go into an aqueous milieu to get a second emulsion of water in oil in water. As you remove the solvent, you form, uh, you solidify your functionalized nanoparticles, which you can then uh, conjugate in an aqueous buffer with your target ligand to get your target ligand conjugated nanoparticle. Now there's two strategies for conjugation. One is uh, the prefabrication where you're actually conjugating to the polymer itself. So this is a target ligand that, um, because this is an organic uh, uh, reaction, this is, needs to be stable to organics. You then conjugate, you isolate to your uh, polymer target ligand, then you make your nanoparticles. The one, the one I mentioned before is the post-fabrication where you make your nanoparticle, and then to the surface of it, you get your functional groups and you conjugate to your target ligand in aqueous buffer. Now, there's a number of different uh, target ligand formats, uh, anywhere from your monoclonal antibodies of 150,000 Dalton down to your small molecule of only about 500 Dalton. The larger ones tend to have higher specificity and affinity, but the lower ones can compensate by increasing the numbers of um, excuse me, ligands on the surface to uh, give an avidity effect. Um, most any of these formats have some flexibility in the conjugation depending on the molecular structure. Uh, in terms of cost and scalability, uh, biologics are scalable, small molecules are scalable, depending on the complexity for the cost. Uh, the solid phase synthesis tends to be a bit more expensive at the larger scales. In terms of stability and manufacturing, as I mentioned, the uh, prefabrication, the molecules need to be stable to both the organic solvent and to the homogenization, which could be up to about 20,000 PSI. So many of these proteins would not fit that and would need to go post-fabrication. In terms of the chemistries, so a number of different chemistries. I have three examples here of uh, melamid, azide, and carboxylate that you could use at the terminus of your PEG. Um, some of the factors involved uh, are the availability of the polymers. So uh, are, are there manufacturers that have these uh, functionalized polymers available? Uh, can they make them GMP? Um, are those chemistries cross-reactive with the payloads? Can they be used? Um, uh, when encapsulating. You also have to consider coupling kinetics of the conjugation and stability of the linkage after the conjugation. And then uh, is your functionality uh, reactive to any endogenous molecules in vivo? If it is, then you may need to work out a capping strategy uh, to make sure that there's no reactive species. Okay, so once you have your functionalized polymer, there's a list of different uh, assays that we'll use to characterize it. Molar mass by NMRGPC, polydispersity, uh, inherent viscosity by capillary viscometry, thermal stability by differential scanning calorimetry, residual monomer, and functionality assay by NMR and uh, fluorescent assay. So what I'd like to focus on is this functionality assay, this in use, uh, we found this uh, requires some extra attention. Okay, so uh, the in-use assay is actually uh, two different assays. One is for the polymer itself, and one is for the nanoparticle once it's formed. So for the functionalized uh, PEG polymer, 
we use a functionalized fluorophore that because this is going to be an organic solvent, this needs to be an organic soluble fluorophore where you react it with an excess of the fluorophore to, to push it toward completion and then uh, quantify your fluorophore labeled polymer. For the um, nanoparticle surface functionality, it's very similar except this one is a aqueous buffer. So you need a, a, a fluorophore a soluble and aqueous. You make your a fluorophore labeled nanoparticle and then you could deformulate in organic solvent and look at uh, the fluorophore labeled polymer and quantify that. So here's an example of the polymer functionality where we used Alexa Dibo to react with the azide PEG PLA. And this top reverse phase uh, UPLC trace shows uh, using uh, evaporative light scattering detection, which will detect uh, all mass of non-volatile substances. So all the components in the, in the nanoparticle here shows the PEG PLA uh, eluding around here in this peak. Uh, if we look at the functionalization reaction, um, and this is by UV vis at 488 for the Alexa. You can see the excess dye in the reaction, and then the main peak that's eluding at the same time as, as the peak in the uh, evaporative light scattering detection. But we also see some species, low level species of maybe PEG and smaller fragments of the PEG PLA. Now, when we saw that, we looked at um, you know, the, the analysis of these. Uh, PEG PLA, we found that the vendors, uh, you know, are showing NMR with high functionalities. When we measured it with the uh, in-use assay, we found um, they didn't quite match uh, what was uh, found in the NMR data. Uh, it could be that uh, the NMR is, it may, it may be difficult in the NMR to differentiate between a, a PEG PLA and a fragment of a PEG PLA. We took a little closer look at this um, using the uh, just the azide PEG OH uh, initiator of the PLA polymerization reaction to see how functional that was. And so in this um, assay, we uh, the red is the PEG initiator, and then the azido PEG PLA is in the blue. So uh, essentially, the the PEG uh, initiator, which just has the OH group off the PEG, uh, but reacts, the DIBO reacts with the azido, you get essentially 100% you know, quanti quantification uh, reaction um, of the dye. But the PEG PLA didn't, uh, takes a little bit longer, but uh, never quite reached uh, full functionalization. Um, what we found with the azido PEG was that a number of different um, batches and different vendors seemed to match fairly good with the functionalization assay, um, showing that you know, maybe the initial PEG PLA at the different vendors um, may have some um, uh, issues in the NMR. So it's important to have an orthogonal method for characterizing the functionalization of your uh, functional group within the polymer. Next, I'd like to turn to the target ligand density assay. So this was, uh, we thought would be a little bit easy at the beginning um, using you know, what's in the literature. A lot of people use, a, you quantify the total protein that's put in the reaction. Uh, you quantify the protein that's free in the filtrate after dialysis or after centrifugal uh, filtration. Um, and then you take the total minus free to get you the conjugated. But what we find is this is an indirect. We're not measuring what's conjugated, we're measuring uh, what's left over. And adsorb protein on the surfaces and nanoparticle overestimates what's conjugated on the ligand. So we tried a number of different um, attempts to uh, do a direct assay. We tried uh, digesting the PLA so that we can get the target ligand and the PEG as a stub uh, and be able to quantify that because that'd be more aqueous soluble. Um, pH or enzymes, we weren't able to fully digest. We were able to get some di degradation and digestion, but not fully. Um, we tried to go to GPC organic methods, but the, the peaks were too broad and we weren't able to get good resolution between the ligand polymer from the polymer. And then we tried capillary isoelectric focusing, but there was too much interference from the polymer. We tried a direct assay where we 
uh, tried to conjugate the fluorescent dye to lysines on the protein, but we realized that it's too dependent on the, the fluorescent conjugation um, to interpret. So then we went with uh, the intrinsic fluorescence of the protein itself. So the, the tryptophans have some intrinsic fluorescence um, that you can use. And so we used the double detector evaporative light scattering with, um, with the uh, intrinsic absorbance and fluorescence to get the ligand polymer to polymer ratio in order to get the target ligand density. So here's an example where we spiked uh, free target ligand as a control with no functional group in with the nanoparticle. And so uh, in our ELS detector, we see that the free TLFAB elutes here. We see that the PEG PLA elutes here. We get some of the smaller PEG PLA species. In the UV channel um, or fluorescence channel, this, in this case, there was enough uh, to see at the 280. Uh, you can see the free TL, but uh, the PEG PLA is transparent in UV. So that's why you have to use the ELS. Now, when we look at a conjugated reaction, what we see is that uh, the FAB conjugates with the PEG PLA and elutes in the, the um, same retention time as the PEG PLA here. Uh, in the UV channel, you see that the FAB is is showing up here, and uh, you do see some free target ligand fab uh, in there as well. Um, because ELS is not necessarily linear, you do need to get a standard curve of what you're looking at in order to quantify these. Um, so the target ligand density turned out um, to be very useful in helping to determine, um, you know, how much you've at actually attached on the nanoparticle. So our case study here is on um, targeting nanoparticles to dendritic cells in uh, spleen and lymph nodes. Um, so if you uh, target the dendritic cell with an antigen um, that you're targeting for some of these autoimmune disorders such as type one diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. Uh, if you have your hydro, uh, phobic payload, which is a tolerance permissive immunomodulator, the dendritic cell will take up the particle, uh, process the antigen, present it to T cells, and in the presence of that immunomodulator will uh, help to differentiate and expand the T cell population and convert it to Treg cells that uh, promote immunotolerance. So in our case, we um, used these uh, dendritic cell targeting ligands conjugated them to nanoparticles. Um, and we're able to show that we can control the target ligand density in nanomole per mig of nanoparticle uh, by controlling the amount of target ligand to um, reactive groups in the nanoparticle. We then put that into a cell, in vitro cell uptake assay, and we're able to see that uh, there's a uh, a dependence on the target ligand density for cell uptake. So I'll walk you through this. So the blue is your targeted nanoparticle. This is your dendritic cell specific uh, fab conjugated to the nanoparticle at different target ligand densities. So uh, in the reaction, it was uh, different ratios, but you can see uh, X axis is um, higher target ligand density uh, as you go to the left, uh, I'm sorry, as you go to the right. So you start low, uh, as you increase your target ligand density, there's greater uptake, it plateaus, but at some point it starts to come down. And, and we think that may be some sort of steric effect uh, where too many target ligands are bumping against each other and not uh, reacting to the receptor well. Um, all the other controls, non-specific fab conjugated to the nanoparticle here, um, cis-capped nanoparticle alone. The, the DC-specific fab non-covalently uh, adsorbed to non-functional nanoparticle uh, gives no uptake here. So it's really the conjugated target ligand specific for the dendritic cell that's important for uh, cell uptake. Okay, then um, 
uh, going quickly here, in vivo, we were able to show targeting uh, by fax analysis. And in terms of bioactivity, um, we're able to work with an antigen-specific T-cell adoptive transfer model, where we had antigen-specific T-cells transplanted to mice. Uh, on day one, we injected uh, targeted and non-targeted nanoparticles. Uh, then we took the spleens and uh, looked at the fax analysis. The targeted nanoparticle shows uh, increase in the expansion of antigen-specific T cells in the spleen compared to non-targeted nanoparticles in a dose-dependent manner from uh, 10 nanograms to 1,000 nanograms. Um, and this was statistically significant versus the uh, controlled non-targeted nanoparticle. So this shows great promise um, that we can use targeted ligands to um, uh, target in vivo and have bioactivity. Um, so some of the key take home messages is um, functionalized polymers need special attention for the analytical, as well as the target ligand density. Um, those can be challenging and that we can uh, get improved targeting to cells and tissues of interest. I'd like to thank uh, the folks on this project from VTEX Farm Sci and the uh, Inflammation and Immunology Research Unit. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Cool, thank you. So now we'll begin the Q&A portion. Uh, so my name is Jeff Clarkson. I'm a principal scientist at NCL. Uh, thank you for the questions. I know we're a little over time and a lot of questions asked were answered already. But we do have a question here for uh, you, Roger. How did you prevent the loaded bioactive agent from leaking out of the nanoparticles when you use post-fabrication method? I think that depends on your engineering and your formulation. You need to work out your, um, your conditions to uh, slow down the release. Okay. Um, question just came in now. Another one for you, Roger. Uh, very nice talk. Can I have a related published article that I can follow to design a similar study for other nanopolymers, especially for dendritic cell stimulation? And then also, if you want to visualize a nanoparticle, what approaches can we do? Yeah, to visualize it, I think cryo-TEM is your best bet. Um, I'd have to look up uh, related published articles. Okay. For that. And then they also asked, uh, how did you conjugate the antigen that specifically targeted the dendritic cell? Can I target any other cells of interest? So I think the conjugation for that one was um, uh, azide um, DBCO and azide click chemistry. Um, and if you want to target other cells of interest, it depends on your targeting ligand. Uh, you need to choose the right one for that. Oh, right. Um, I have one more question, which I think is for Jean-Luc. How does a lipid light scattering affect the assessment of nucleic acid encapsulation? Thanks. That's a good question. Um, I'm actually not sure how to answer it. <laughs> so like, <laughs> if, if uh, the, it, you know, there's light scattering between particles, not going to affect things because we're measuring the particle in isolation. But then um, I'd have to think a little bit about how the lipid affects the light, the excitation light getting into the particle, because remember these particles are smaller than the wavelength of light. So it's not like it just bounces off in the same way. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little tricky, I think. It probably depends on the formulation, honestly. And just a, a follow on question for you, Jean Luc, is yeah. um, how do we know that particle concentration is accurate? I mean to say, what will be acceptable orthogonal measurement for verification and what is the size range of particles that your method applies to? Good question. Okay, so for the size range, we measure from about 50 nanometers up to two microns with fluorescence and up to 10 microns with just the electrical method. Um, for concentration references, uh, we would recommend just running um, polystyrene beads or something with a known concentration, right? And that's how we calibrate our cartridges actually. So. You can um, do that anytime on the system, but also you can spike those particles into your measurement and that can serve as a built-in positive control for size and concentration with every measurement. <clears throat> okay, thank you. 
And then one last question, and this is for Tony. So in your presentation, you show the continuous manufacturing process as it applies to liposomes and Dr. Rubison specifically. Can this be applied to other APIs as well as other nano platforms? Uh, yes, yeah, so we can apply you know, the, for UV Viz and others where we're looking at uh, total API. Um, it'd have to be active for, for the UV Viz uh, range. We can also use Raman and other techniques as well uh, to expand or, or a combination of these techniques. Um, and then this is really where the soft sensor approach comes in, where we can take multiple inputs uh, uh, from uh, you know from these different sensors and, and put them together uh, for uh, for a similar output. Um, so for mRNA and others, there would have to be a different approach that we take than UV vis alone, for example. Uh, but we can really uh, expand to you know similar type if it's a similar type of API to Docs Rubison, uh, small molecule uh, anthracycline and and so forth. Then we we should be able to use a very similar approach uh, to what we use for Docs Rubison. Okay, great. Thank you. So that's all the questions that was in the, the Q&A that haven't been answered. I know we're a little over time, but I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, again, on behalf of the NNI and the CEO, thank you for attending and thank you to the speakers presenting great presentations today. And as was mentioned earlier, this will be available online as a recorded presentation. So please look out for that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.